Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Uh, um. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's get into it. Brock Powell, my old friend and coach, how you doing? I'm doing well, buddy. I'm doing really well. Man, I am thrilled to be talking to you about Hamster and Gretel. Uh, the, the show was phenomenal. You played Lyle, one of the fraternal twins. And the funny part is, I was there when you were working on that hamster voice in the very beginning. You were telling me, we were walking through the park. And we saw this squirrel and you were working on this like hamster or squirrel voice. And you're like, I signed an NDA. I can't tell you what it is, but I got an audition for something. And you're just running around chirping like a chipmunk trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And here we are. You know, you're one of the supporting cast members in this series. Yeah, I will. I will say so. Uh, hamster on the show is played by Beck Bennett. I do a lot of creature sounds. Uh, I think that particular day was a different Disney project. Uh, but I do a lot on Mickey Mouse Funhouse doing tons of gophers and squirrels. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm always practicing, you know, I'm a fan first. So I, I try to go, um, I remember that day we were going through the actual park and, you know, you try to big, small human. Otherwise you, you try to ground your performances in the real world. And because I'm a creature voice actor who, uh, you know, following in the footsteps of the great D Bradley Baker and Frank Welker, uh, it's a really cool opportunity to be able to sort of come up with my own take on it, my own formula. And, you know, um, I did a lot of creature voices uh, for the Phineas and Ferb movie. I did a lot of creature voices on Milo Murphy's Law. It's definitely been interesting because this show, I think I'm only doing one or two creatures so far, but I'm getting to play a lot of like speaking villains, which is really, really fun. Um, and Lyle's obviously such a departure from the creature stuff because, you know, uh, you, depending on people's stances on siblings, I guess a little brother can be considered an animal, but <laughs> Lyle is, uh, Lyle's a lot of fun. He's, uh, he's definitely not the smart one. He's the strong one. Um, and someone who is often talking first and then thinking about what I said after, uh, I can certainly relate. <laughs> well, you are an older brother. So you do have that sibling dynamic going for you. Yeah, I, I will say, actually, we, uh, Allison Stoner and I were talking about it. Um, the way she portrays the character, it's actually not too far off from how my actual sister, kind of her, her natural kind of valley, uh, she kind of has that little upspeak. Uh, so it's really kind of interesting because it, it sort of does feel like my real family dynamic. Yeah. Well, the fun part with all this is you started training. You know, your goal was to sit there and get into animation. You started training with Bill Farmer, who's the voice of Goofy and Pluto, and then you end up becoming Pluto's house and the voice yeah, of so, Pluto's <laughs> house. So, so I, I do. Yeah, it's, it is. I, I say that I'm following the, the pop, the pop prints here. Uh, the Teddy, the doghouse on Mickey Mouse Funhouse is another character that I play. One of my absolute favorites. And yeah, he's best friends with Pluto. Uh, and he is a talking doghouse that barks and acts like a dog. Uh, which he is the best friend to um, Funny the Funhouse, played by Harvey Gann, who's wonderful on the show. Um, a lot of dynamics. I, I constantly have to, uh, you know, I'm just constantly feeling grateful for the opportunity to, to not only um, apply what my mentor taught me, but also get to work alongside my mentor, which a lot of people don't get that opportunity. Um, so, so getting to create a new character alongside Bill's legacy characters it, it's literally Disney magic. It's so, it's so incredibly, I feel so incredibly fortunate. It absolutely is. But with ha Hamster and Gretel, you didn't get any time off. Dan sat there and made you host the panel on top of it. Like you didn't just get to be a guest. You had to be MC on top of it. Well, I, <laughs> so San Diego Comic-Con, we had an amazing host with Liza Coach, who's, who's on the show. Uh, I think one of the things that's so cool about this in the D23 panel where I moderated, I felt super, you know, just it was so great to be up there. Um, everybody that is working on the show is such a fan of the, of the project and the series that it's a unique dynamic where any one of us could get up and moderate a conversation because we really do like each other. Uh, so I feel super fortunate to be the one that they trusted. Kind of funny, um, I played the moderator of a panel 
in the pilot episode. So it was really kind of fun to be able to take that and be like, oh, yeah, this is me playing the moderator on TV. And now here I am moderating on TV or streaming services. But Yeah. Well, the beautiful thing is you're having such a good time. The show's a lot of fun. It falls in line with, with Phineas and Ferb and, and the work that Dan's already done and established in the last decade and a half. That to be a part of his legacy has got to be mind-blowing from being that guy who was listening to podcasts about voice acting to ended up being the guy who is now voice acting. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you know my story and you know that um, – I feel like there's definitely a chain too in our our friendship. And prior to this interview, I have had the opportunity to coach you in voiceover. And now, on top of this, you're you're starting your own career, and the that's that is the dream for for not just the craft, but to be a part of the legacy of passing on the passion and the information because it really is a craft. Um, I think uh, the podcasts like. Uh, I hear voices or we talk funny or uh, Rob's talking tunes. There are so many free resources right now that people who are fans of this cannot just hear how it's not just Google. Now, now you can actually hear play by play how these incredible actors, uh, Bill Farmer, Keith David, um, these incredible performers, Eric Bowser, how did they get started? Um, and so being a part of that in that, yeah, I did. A lot of my training came from, podcast and listening to interviews over a decade and a half and I started in the Disney parks and when we were there for D23 I got a chance to go into California Adventure where I worked where I was there the, the first and last day they did the Phineas and Ferb parade which ran for a couple of years I was there sitting backstage watching the Phineas and Ferb float take off into the park and to be back there with Dan and there was Swampy it's, it's, it's crazy. There, there, is, there are no words. It's just, it really is a lot of gratitude and pinching myself. So I'm grateful. Ow. I'm grateful. Ow. It has a bit of that Steve Martin feel since he started off in the wow. magic shop in Disneyland. He sure did. Robin, Robin started there. Uh, Steve started there. There's, there are a lot of voice actors now that are working. Isaac Robinson Smith, who is also on the show, uh, a dear friend we met in the park. Uh, Caitlin Robrock, who voices some characters for the company, which uh, started in the park. We, yeah. we all knew each other. Uh, the first time I met Brad, Brad Island, who voices Mickey Mouse for the company, um, I met him at the park. Uh, he was visiting, but it was just like all these weird connections come from that place. Right. And Caitlin's a sweetheart. She's fun. Caitlin's a wonderful person. And uh, it, it's amazing to see how her career has blossomed and just seeing her talent get recognized makes me really happy. You know, with everybody in voice acting and the talent and the love for Disney that brought them into Disney, what was the Disney cartoon that clicked in your head and you're like, this is the company that I got to be a part of? Yeah, it's so funny. I, yeah. Uh, I mean, as a kid, I was a Disney afternoon junkie. I was just absolutely, completely addicted and raised by Disney afternoon. And that was also... Uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a home that uh, my parents didn't live together and, and we were split between houses sometimes and moving a lot. So it was nice to be able to have um, that kind of consistency, which the programming clock uh, provided. So to be in a place now where literally just last week I was hanging out with Terry McGovern, who voices Launchpad McQuack in the original series. And the entire time I'm like, <laughs> what is happening? Um, my show is definitely Goof Troop, which is is most likely, you know, why I reached out to Bill when I did looking for mentorship, because that character really did feel like the father figure I wanted. Uh, and how lucky I am that I've, I've gotten that. Um, I feel really grateful to know Bill and I've learned so much from him. Uh, Darkwing Duck, definitely up there as well. Uh, and then Gargoyles, I think hands down that that really scratched the itch of my gothic love of kind of horror and monsters and creature sounds. Um, and and I still watch and love those shows, which is like we've died. My fiance had never watched Gargoyles front to back. So we started binging it and I'm sitting there like excited, like as if it's Game of Thrones or something that's new. And I, I was like, where's it going? But watching that show layered and how Greg Weissman and, and the, the whole team layers these like Shakespearean Celtic elements in with 
modern New York, modern 1994 New York, uh, and laser guns and, and cybernetics. It's so it's such a wild show. I can't believe they got it on the air. It's great. And mind you, you burned dinner while watching the first three episodes because you wanted yeah, to make absolutely. sure she enjoyed it. You know, absolutely, yeah. And then I turned to stone because I was cursed for burning dinner. So. <laughs> and then I live again. Well, on the bright side, when Disney buys the Anaheim Ducks back and returns them to the Mighty Ducks, you can be the voice of Wild wow. Wing in the relaunch cartoon. Oh, you're making man, you're taking me back. I love the Mighty Ducks. Um, yeah. Jim Belushi was the coach on that, and he. I remember as a kid being like, wow, what a great character. What a great, even the vocalizations. Like I was aware at that point, oh, that's a celebrity. That's a, that's a, a person putting that performance on. But I remember, uh, yeah, a lot of great, um, especially in the villains and, and, you know, to tie it full circle, the villains on the Disney afternoon cartoons and the Disney cartoons were always my favorite. So to be, uh, you know, voicing fist puncher against the destructress and uh, my new villain premieres, I think, this week, uh, Big Baby. Um, so to be a part of the rogues gallery that I grew up with, like, you know, with Quacker Jack and all these great Darkwing Duck villains and DuckTales villains, it's really wild. It's well, wild. don't worry, no one's after your number one dime, so we're good to go. <laughs> That's funny. Well, just remember, my agent gets 10% of that. <laughs> <laughs> Penny's on the dollar, man, Penny's on the dollar. So, <laughs> but it's beautiful what you're doing. It's beautiful how everything's going on. To go from California Adventure to being a voice in a Disney in a Disney series and several Disney series actually to being a moderator at D twenty three and then being able to walk the floor in remote anonymity. What is that like to sit there and now you know instead of being a attendee at the convention now you're a guest at the convention because it's a different line that's getting crossed. Uh, you know, D twenty three is one of those events that no matter if you're invited or attending, everyone is treated, you know, with the same magic and respect. And I think all of us panelists and guests were, um, you're hit with that wonder. I mean, I, I went in between the panels and I went and snuck into um, the Muppet Christmas Carol 35th panel. And I was sitting there just like, and I'm there for, for work, you know, I'm air quoting, I'm working. Um, but I'm, I'm watching these things and feeling that same sense of wonder. I don't know many other companies that can evoke that feeling in people. Um, so to be a part of this and the hundred year legacy of this company, um, I, I just can't wait to see what comes next. I can't wait to see what comes next with the show. Uh, we have so many more great episodes of Hamster and Gretel coming. Uh, our album's out. Um, I may or may not have uh, programmed a villain's block of music for uh, Sir Sirius XM uh, uh, and a Disney takeover that they did, which is going to air in October. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that's still coming. Um, I just feel so excited to be a part of it. And I'm just super pumped, pun intended. <laughs> well, luckily, you're not Tom Holland spoiling everything. So that's the beautiful part. <laughs> Thank you. But we'll throw, you know, you mentioned how the D23 makes you feel something that most other companies can't feel. So Kevin Phoenix, our good friend who introduced us to each other. Love uh, Kevin, yes. We are sitting in the parks panel covering it and they're revealing all the new rides coming internationally and everything else. And here are two men with baritone and bass voices, well over six feet tall each, both having had either football or wrestling backgrounds, tearing up at this presentation and almost a sense of embarrassment yet belonging while tearing up. And that's the Disney magic that comes with it. Yeah, I, absolutely. The, the Disney magic and also, you know, the, the tear-stained souvenir bags. It's <laughs> D, D23 is so much of that, like, it, if you could bottle nostalgia, <laughs> that's what that feels like. Um, and not just the past. But the excitement, like you're talking about, of like, they're doing that. They're going to do that. They're bringing that back. They're trying this. They're going to do this thing. There's a what? You know, I, I kept walking around the floor and having that experience. Like, they're doing what? <laughs> it was really cool. But to be there at the epicenter, that was really neat. On top of all that, this is the centennial anniversary of Disney. And to be years. a part of the 100-year anniversary of Disney's founding, what does that mean to you as a performer being a part of Hamster and Gretel and all the other productions that you're working on, whether it's Disney Junior, Disney XD, Disney Channel proper, et cetera. Well, I, you can quote me on this. It all started with a mouse, and I'm glad to continue it. Uh, 
by being associated with a hamster. So uh, <laughs> I I uh, am so thrilled to be on the show to be a part of this. Um, Walt Disney wasn't just the uh, you know the creative force behind these stories. He was the original voice actor for animation. We did not have a job until Walt was the one who created not only speaking as Mickey, he was the initial Minnie. Uh, and he had uh, used some pitching technology to create the Yoohoo, but the original voice of Minnie and Mickey were both Walt Disney. So I definitely feel, um, uh, you know, he was a kindred spirit in so many ways as a foreigner and um, changing the way stories are told. But a hundred years later, a hundred years later, uh, people are talking about animation and being moved by animation and stories and cultures and um, glass ceilings and indifferences are being broken over the medium of, of animation, which is just uh, incredible to me. Uh, and I recently, my, my uh, grandmother passed. A couple years back, yeah. and I, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. But I recently, um, wonderful lady, I, I, who really instilled my love of, love of Disney early on, uh, told me, and I've since found that this was true. My great grandparents were at the premiere of Snow White, which is crazy to now be. So again, California Adventure, where I was working, now has Carthay Circle, which is where the Snow White premiere party was, and and all of that. So to literally have my dreams of working for Disney come full circle generationally, it's it's really really cool, and has made this even more special. And I hope, uh, you know, in a hundred years, there's. 20 more um, Hamster and Gretel spinoffs. I hope it just keeps going. I hope this, uh, yeah, I just, I, I'm so excited to see what the future holds for this company and these stories. All right. Since we mentioned the Disney afternoon being your foundation. Yeah. Let's go, let's go back a hundred years and revisit the Fab Five. If, you know, of the Fab Five, who has to be your favorite? I kind of know where this might lead, but you know. <laughs> Well, okay. If you're if you're strictly speaking, the Fab Five, it's Goofy, obviously. Right. Uh, but if you're extending to the original Disney uh, Corral, it actually goes to Pete the Cat. Right. So uh, Pete Pigleg Pete is one of my all time favorite villains. I've always had a, an affinity for the villains, even well before I was uh, wanting to be one. Um, I love Pete and and Jim Cummings, who took over for for uh, Billy. Um, Billy Bletcher, who also voiced Baluda for Popeye cartoons, uh, does an amazing job with the character, really rounds him out. Um, so that's actually my actual favorite original Disney character is Pete, but my Fab Five favorite is, is Goofy. You know, I, I had to keep my cool around Daniel Ross when I found out he was Donald. And I was just yeah. like, all right, don't, don't blurt it out. Don't blurt it out. Just keep calm. You know, and my level of calm is not very calm. So, you know, it eventually comes out pretty quick and uh, hard and fast. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing legacy and it's uh, amazing to know all these actors um, that not only are the official voices, but have come in to voice the characters uh, on, on different times and occasions. It's, it's just amazing what these stories, uh, the, these stories have so much magic for everybody. And it's always cool getting, um, different actors' interpretations in these moments, I think. Now, personal question for you on top of sure. all of this. All right. For the young kids, Star 67 actually blocks the number from showing up so people don't know who's calling. Since you and your fiancé are both performers, do you ever Star 67 your fiancé, you know, block the number and leave a message practicing with new voices to see if she'll figure it out or not? That's funny. Well, uh, I will say my fiance is also a voice actor, on camera actor, uh, but we met because she was, ex you know, extending her talents into voiceover. That was how we met. And now there's a couple of projects that we're going to be on together. I can't say what they are, but they are going to be coming out soon. Um, and she's doing some of her own stuff as well on her own voiceover projects. She's the one who practices. Uh, so I'll hear like a little, like a little kid giggle. And I swear, I was like, I didn't know my fiance was home. And I thought my house, this joint is haunted. I was like, what, who is that? <laughs> and it was, it was Cameron practicing. Um, she was doing an impression of, uh, uh one of the Powerpuff girls perfectly. And I was like, Did my, is my phone on? What is <laughs> That's phenomenal. And let, let's name drop her real quick. If you don't mind, if that's okay with you. Sure. Uh, she has a very famous name 
because a professional wrestler in the WWE has taken it as his as his stage name, and her yes. name is Cameron Grimes. Cameron Grimes. <laughs> so Cameron Grimes and the wrestler Cameron Grimes have a really fun online duel that occurs once in a while because it's her name and he acquired it, not realizing that that was the name of a famous soap opera star. So it's a really fun kind of to see them barb back and forth, but the relationship there is good. And I'm actually the wrestling fan in the house. So I'll constantly be like, tweet, tweet at him. Like, <laughs> Does this mean we need to get her a United uh, North American heavyweight <laughs> title just for the house? I mean, I'm not, I, if, if, uh, it'd be cool to have in the office. We've got some space over there. All right, just making sure because you know he was North American heavyweight champion, so we got to do something for her in that same vein. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and Brock, since you are the pro wrestling fan, you know, let's say Disney pitches a pro wrestling show. What type of pro wrestling show do you want it to be? Because there was, you know, uh, Mucha Lucha over on the other guy's channel. Oh yeah, sure. But let's bring it home to back to Mickey and see what he'll come up with. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I don't know if they've done. Yeah, they used to do these like. Uh, um, the goofy how-to so it'd be funny to get a like so you want to be a pro wrestler and like have goofy uh maybe team up with some of these like wrestling icons or animated versions of them um that that would be something that i think would be really fun uh, with hamster uh, hamster and gretel it airs i believe saturday morning still correct yeah saturday mornings we have five episodes on disney plus right now that you can go watch right now uh, and then more to be added very soon. And then mostly every uh, Saturday morning. Then with the Halloween schedule, I think that there might be some other episodes appearing around. So just uh, check your local listings and uh, set that DVR if you're watching it live like I am. Because I got I to gotta watch it. I got to watch it as soon as it's up. Do you still have that childhood, childhood thrill of getting up Saturday morning, but now to watch yourself? go oh my god you know that's me level of it especially with hamster and gretel it you know it's one of those things that i certainly feel like it is a part of my job to need to continue to watch sorry by the way if you hear that that's jason Voorhees. it's it's halloween around here and there's a if you hear that chainsaw that it's uh <laughs> my gardener who's amazing we are constantly um having to reschedule gardening because i have i have a home studio so I'm in my home office. My home studio is in the backyard. There's a little unattached home studio there. But because I've been having so many sessions, the poor gardener keeps getting moved later and later. And then today it was just like, oh man, just come on, just come here and do it and then we'll make it work. So if you hear that, my apologies. But um, uh, as part of my job and, and sort of like that ritual of being a full human and, and embracing my inner child as an artist, I do watch cartoons every Saturday. I don't always just watch mine. Um, I've been lucky enough where for the last few months, there's been new episodes of things that I've been working on, but I watch every episode of a, of a series I work on, even if I'm not in the episode. Um, part of it is because there are so many, you know, the voice actors get, get um, so much credit and in, in, in ways, it, you know, the talent is due to so many people. Um, we have incredible voice directors. We have incredible writers. We have incredible animators, uh, our producers. Everybody who make, make, you know, any one of these shows that we work on, there are hundreds of hands that make it happen. So I always try to watch because it's always fun to go into a session. And, you know, um, that's one of my things is I always think it's important to give back uh, and to give that gratitude to every single person. So everyone from, the, you know, the engineer running the microphone to the, the, the person who's running the scripts in. Um, without them, I don't have words to say and they don't get recorded. So it's, it's sort of like a team sport for me. I, I think it's like really important to support it as, uh, you know, hey, I'm not, I'm not in the playoffs, but the whole team's going. So even if I'm on the bench or on the sidelines for an episode, it doesn't really feel that way because I'm still very actively cheering on everybody involved. Um, it's, it's really, really cool. My favorite part is when I walk out of the room because I have severe ADHD. So sometimes I will walk out of the room to get a snack or something and the, the show's still playing. And I'll walk back in and go, oh, I love that voice. Who did? Oh, it was me. It was me. I did that. And so, you know, and not tuning my own horn, but just like that fun, like sometimes I catch myself off guard because I'm like, oh, that's an intro. Oh, that, yeah, I did that. That was a weird choice I made that day. Um, and that's one of the, the blessings of the curses of having ADHD because I honestly forget. Like, I forget voices. I forget lines. I forget like ad libs. And then it isn't until later that someone's like, yeah, you made that up. Or like, you know, Brock riffed on that. It was like, oh, I did? I I kind of black out a little bit. 
All right, Brock, before I let you go, we have to ask, since you are watching the cartoons on Saturday morning, what is the Saturday morning cereal? Well, <laughs> now it's grape nuts because I'm, I'm approaching 34 and we're watching the fiber uh, and the cholesterol. But uh, the cereal of choice would probably be Fruity Pebbles or Captain Crunch. I like that. I, I like it. It's got to be crisp, almost, you know, dangerous because if you don't get the milk ratio right, you're cutting the top of your mouth. Uh, I like I live on the edge. So. <laughs> Brock Powell, it is always fun to chat on a personal level. This is the first time we've done this on a professional level as an interview. Where first can of many. Every, it's going to be first of many, and we're going to have to get together soon for lunch just so we can hang out and crack some more jokes. I would like that, yeah. You know, where can we find you on social media if we want to connect with you? And then where can we find your Cameron so we can follow her arguing with the other Cameron Grimes? Absolutely. Uh, well, let me start with my fiance, who is the light of my life. And I'm more excited about the things she's achieving right now. I'm so proud of her um, because she's had this long, crazy, incredible career and is continuing to work on camera. And now to come into voiceover um, on all four cylinders, it's just amazing. Um, and she's so funny. It makes me laugh all the time. Uh, Cameron Grimes, you can, if you type that in, she's the one that comes up, C-A-M-R-Y-N. Um, she's uh, on Instagram, Twitter, uh, and you can watch her on Young and the Restless uh, pretty much every day. Uh, and then I'm Brock Talks. Now here we go. Here's where it gets confusing. On Instagram and most other socials like Instagram and TikTok, I'm Brock Talks. B R O C K T A L K S. But because there is a sweet little lady who runs a podcast and her last name is Brock on Twitter, there is uh, Brock, that Brock Talks is taken. So on Twitter, I am. Phonetically, Brock Talks. So B R O C K T O C K S. So you can find me on all of those. Hello, Brock Powell. It is always a pleasure. Great to see you, my friend. I love the fact that we trained in animation, which led me to sports announcing. But listen, so so long as the door is open, I'm there. Yeah, right. Look, <laughs> you, we talk about the full circle. I, you, you, there, the amazing thing about this industry is how often uh, these things come back around, and you never know. Maybe very soon you'll be voicing uh, a sports announcer in animation because you've got that uh, skill under your belt. That's the goal, man. You know, we'll make that happen. We'll make Simon Baz happen. We practice that quite a bit. So, DC, if you're listening, I'm available. <laughs> got to plug that every once in a while. Brock knows that. Absolutely. Brock Powell, it's been a great pleasure. Disney Channel, Disney Plus, Disney XD, everywhere that Disney goes. You can find this, man. Thank you so much for today. My, my, my pleasure. Okay, talk to you later, buddy. Bye.